May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my, our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord. Be seated. Good morning. It's 43 days after Easter. The church this past Friday celebrated the ascension of our Lord into heaven. And now we can shout not just, He is risen, but we can shout, He is risen into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God. And you know what that means, right? Tag, we're it. In Acts, we learn that he, Jesus, was taken up into a cloud while they were watching, and they could no longer see him. Just before that miraculous ascension moment, Jesus told the disciples, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. He said that once the Holy Spirit came on them, they would receive power to go out. In effect, they would change from being disciples, just students and followers of Jesus, to being apostles sent out. Centuries later, the prophet Centuries earlier, the prophet Joel had said in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. He went on to say, even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. The Holy Spirit would fall on sons and daughters and old people and young, and that includes us. Look around you. Tag, we're it. What does it look like to be it? How did it play out in the first few centuries when so many people were becoming Christians? Is there anything we can learn from what they did then for us today? Over the last several Sundays, we've been wondering about the secret sauce that allowed the early church to be it in the Roman Empire. An empire not unlike our own, which is why it's interesting to look at this question. The Roman Empire was large and powerful like the United States. It had various gods at whose temples one could worship. It had societal stratifications, dues-paying associations and clubs, work at various levels of honor and dishonor, wide economic and financial disparity. In Rome, after the ascension, after the outpouring of the Spirit, the early Christians could have boldly asserted that in truth there is one God. They could have challenged the people in Rome and told them, you need to believe in this one God and his son Jesus who came in the flesh, lived, taught, died, then rose from the dead. These sent ones could have been so eager about the message that they were telling everyone, believe in Jesus. If you do, you'll go to heaven after you die and be with God eternally. They could have been so bold, but what we've found out these past few weeks as we've dug into the first two centuries of the fast-growing church is that the church grew not so much by boldly asserting the truths of God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, but by being those truths. Let me say that again. It wasn't so much by asserting truths. It was by being the truths. They fulfilled what Jesus had commanded before he was taken away. Jesus said, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Through tight community, reading and discussing the scriptures and the letters of Paul, weekly Eucharist and fellowship, early Christians began living with distinctive habits. These habits became so ingrained that they became reflexive, 
We remember a couple of weeks ago, Father Tim told us about Perpetua in the amphitheater where Christians were being led to their death by being mauled by fierce animals. Perpetua and the other Christians sentenced to death did not succumb to fear. Rather, they reflexively couldn't help but kiss one another, the kiss of peace just before the animals reached them. They turned the other cheek and let death come. Their astonishing habits of love were forged by the Holy Spirit, and the Roman citizenry took notice. They did quirky things that made no sense in that time, and quite frankly, don't make sense in our time if we do it. They shared their resources. They took care of the poor and the widowed and the orphaned. They buried the dead for free, unheard of in the Roman world, and turned the other cheek to be hit again when evil struck. These and other loving yet costly distinctives created the joy Jesus had foretold. In the gospel we just heard, Jesus is recorded as saying, these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. It's hard to imagine, but Perpetua and many, many martyrs since have gone to their deaths in joy. By these habits and others like not suing people and maintaining sexual purity, they caught the notice of folks around them. Their patient faithfulness to the outworkings of love in the power of the Spirit through multiple generations was, in the words of author Alan Kreider, who wrote The Patient Ferment of the Early Church, a powerful ferment in the culture of their time. This ferment of their distinctives, to use a metaphor, they were in the grape juice of the Roman culture to turn that culture into wine. The early church seemed to have known themselves to be fermenting agents in the grape juice of the Roman culture. Year in and year out, they patiently knew to trust God, not themselves, to do his transforming work through them. God would do the work they would be his vessels. And now we, we, because, you know, tag, we're it, are also called in our cultures and contexts to be the ferment in the grape juice of where we live, on the North Shore of Boston, to turn it into wine. Basically, we've got to be in the grape juice to turn it into wine. Two weeks ago, Father Tim reminded us that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He reminded us that in temples, sacrifice happens. And our job here today, the question we can ask ourselves, can we protect, can we sacrifice our need to control and self-protect? Can we sacrifice our will and let God be responsible for the results of the hard circumstances which happened to us in consequence of following Jesus and his ways? Will we be responsible like Jesus was to lean into God, to lean into Jesus? Jesus who said, I only do what the Father has asked me. And what has Jesus asked, in fact, commanded us? To love one another. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. This love for one another became the ferment in the grape juice of the early Roman church. The people lived and moved and had their being in him. 
as they became the love of God in the midst of their cities and towns and villages, their lives were a fragrance to those who would come to believe. And us, what is our charge? We are to become this love. We are to be the more which people instinctively know is out there. Most people don't know how to access the more. All they know deep inside is that their routines, practices, and relationships somehow don't ultimately satisfy. Our presence in their lives could be key to transforming their lives. Our neighbors, co-workers, exercise groups are secretly watching us. When we each be who God made us to be, marvelously unique. I look across this beautiful group here and there is such uniqueness, every single one of you. When you are marvelously, when we are marvelously ourselves, as God designed us, unique, strong, and wonderful, people will wonder what it is about us that touches a yearning deep inside them, this yearning for the more. We seem to have the more which they want. In a book by Wolfgang Reinbold, I learned that if Christians raise their children as Christians, and the Christian man in the course of a generation also can convince only one of his pagan neighbors, and the Christian woman can convince only one of her pagan friends, lastingly, of the truth of their faith, he and she have done more than we can presuppose in order to explain the growth of the church in the first three centuries. We can do that. One neighbor, one friend, our children. Be who God made you to be with them. Show how you handle setbacks differently from the way the world handles setbacks, for instance, because you know and trust God. Dennis and I had a scary financial situation 20 years ago. We were used to getting a good portion of our annual income from renting out a vacation home we inherited on Martha's Vineyard. We were what farmers describe as land rich but cash poor. So this is sort of an embarrassing story, but that's the truth. <laughs> that particular year, income from renting the property wasn't happening. The months ticked by, no one was nibbling, no one wanted it. And Dennis and I were desperate. <laughs> the real estate agent knew we were desperate. So she was so happy mid-June for a summer rental to call and say there was someone who wanted the property. But there was just one hitch. He was going to pay in grocery bags full of cash. So desperate though we were, I said to the real estate agent, may I call you back in just a few minutes? hung up and Dennis and I talked and we sort of reasoned that the cash was probably ill-gotten gain. I mean, otherwise, why would you be paying? It was a substantial amount of money. It would have covered like three months of living for us, our living expenses in cash. So I called back the real estate agent with Dennis's a blessing and said, we just can't take the money. It's probably ill-gotten gain, and we just can't let that happen. The lady said, huh, most people give up their moral principles when money's involved. And I said, well, we're Christians, and it just doesn't seem like it's the high moral ground to take this money. By wanting to stay within honorable standards, we were a brief ferment in the life of a real estate agent on Martha's Vineyard. An example of a patient ferment that takes years to unfold 
Let me tell you about an exercise class in Manchester by the Sea at the community center. Two mornings a week, I started going there. It was dead quiet. No one ever talked. There'd be the first repetition, total silence, then the second repetition. So I prayed to God and said, is there anything you want me to do? And God said, tell the woman next to you, you like her socks. And I thought, you want me to tell her I like her socks? Tell the woman next to you, you like her socks. So I did. That was earth shattering. There was no conversation in the class yet. The next class, she said, I like your fleece. <laughs> the year went on, and at the end of the year, I thought, this is ridiculous. I'm going to have a tea at my house, and we'll all sit in a big circle in my living room, and we'll go around the circle and say, what's your name? <laughs> How about that, for starters? And tell me something about your life. And we had a teacher, a nurse. We had a speed skater, for heaven's sakes. <laughs> And we got to kind of know each other, but then the next year happened. Summer came. We don't meet in the summers. We met the next year, and I thought, let's have another party. And then they can bring their stuff and show their personality through bringing their stuff, and they did. And then God gave me the idea, why don't you offer to volunteer to run the class over the summer to sort of create kind of a momentum, like be together. So uh, they came to my house every Monday and Thursday morning for exercise, and because I'm a little bit looser as a leader than the woman who just was absolutely silent, um, we would talk or just say there's a library book sale or whatever in the announcements, and it got kind of loose. So by the time we hit that next September, they knew each other. Two of them came to the Mime Stations of the Cross at All Saints in, um, in uh, Amesbury. Four of them came to my ordination. Patient ferment of the exercise class. We started having conversations about God. People would do prayer requests. Something like anyone that kind of believes in God or thinks about that and that's where you're coming from. Would you mind praying for my husband who's, you know, whatever? It took many years to change the culture We've got to be, all of us have to be, the ferment in the grape juice to turn it into wine. Another story is happening right now, as I speak. A neighbor I love is dying. After 40 years of knowing and socializing with this person, a terminal illness is bringing his life to an end. And for the first time in 40 years, years. We are talking about God. One person, one neighbor. What a holy and sacred privilege to be able to bring the Prince of Peace, the Lord of his salvation, into his bedroom, into his heart. Forty years talking about this and that, and now Jesus comes into the conversation. Being immersed in the ways of Christ, having the loving, peaceful mind of Christ, living and giving with all the generosity of Christ, who gave his all for us, inspires the people around us to want to know the more which we seem to be walking in. Here on the North Shore of Boston, can we each be the unique, marvelous individuals God has made and simultaneously love one another, turn the other cheek, trust God? Can we journey together and see what happens? Because, you know, tag, we're it. Let's pray. Michael, Oh, Lord, 
O fount of joy, come into our shadows with your gentle light. Touch the fears and hesitancies which mute us and keep us in the shadow. Breathe into us such peace and courage that we can move into your beckoning light. Be so transformed that we become your lanterns. Of guidance and love. O fount of joy, come into our shadows with your gentle light. That we can become your lanterns of guidance and love as faithful witnesses in quiet service to all whom you have made. In your loving name, we pray. Amen.